So uh, I have to make one announcement. At 2.20, will the farmers please return to E Block? with their officer, please. Hold on now. We got two groups for you today. I'm sorry that we couldn't have a bigger crowd. I know a lot of the guys, I've seen them in different places, whatever, down at The Rock. But we're gonna have a whole new musical program that's gonna come and we're gonna bring some girls, do a lot of dancing too. Okay. Uh, this is groovy enough, you spread the word because we're going to come back. Now the first group that we're going to hear is uh, Jesse Barish and Bill Wolf. And uh, so we'll get on with it now, okay? Thank you. Howdy. I want to leave this place Oh, I want to go I want to leave this place Oh, how I want to go Might be moving out along the highway Baby, go on down some road. Baby, standing on the corner. Mama, she's dressed in black. Baby, standing on the corner. Mama, she's dressed. Might be leaving in the morning, Ooh, maybe never coming, coming back. Sometimes I feel so lonesome I could hang my head and cry Sometimes I feel so lonesome I'd like to hang my head and cry Oh, Mr. Blues, come down and grab me Never give me no reason why yeah. All right, thank you, thank you It's a great honor to be here this evening To thank all the organizers of this event this evening and to say it was very, very <clears throat> good to be back on the West Coast in the United States <clears throat> to hear my brother here, Ed Mead, speak so eloquently and so historically. And um, 
sort of amazing because uh, I remember I did a similar tour like this 30 years ago. <clears throat> and uh, one of the people I met on the tour and helped sponsor the tour over here in Washington was Ed Mead and Mark Cook. And there was a conference called uh, the Convention, <laughs> which was well attended. <laughs> There certainly were a lot of ex-cons that attended this conference. And I suppose if that same conference was held today, when there's over two million prisoners locked behind bars, there would be no seats in any future conference. At that time, there was only 700,000, 750,000 prisoners locked out away in. America's prisons. I'm going to start with my story and take you through a whole lifetime of resistance. My story started in Buffalo, New York in 1952. That's when I was born. <clears throat> my mother was a Mohawk Indian. My father was part Indian, part Cree, part Mohawk. And we were born in the slums of Buffalo, New York. My family is originally from the Mohawk Nation in Brantford, Ontario, Oshwegan Mohawk Territory. There was a time during this time in the 1950s, it was, relative, it was a relative policy of the United States government after what we call the outright wars with the U.S who sought to seize the lands and who by this time had already massacred millions and millions of native peoples throughout the whole Western territory, the whole Western hemisphere. And during this particular time when I was born, it was called sort of like the really dark days for Indian people because at that time, the outright wars of genocide were basically reduced to paper wars or policy wars enacted by the United States government against Indian people. In this particular time, one of the ways the U.S. government uh, tried to enforce the complete assimilation of Indian peoples was to take the Indian children from their families and put them into white foster homes and or the boarding school system, also known as the residential schools. And if, for instance, a native woman had many children or had a few children, uh, somehow lost her husband, as my mother lost her husband as a result of working himself to death at U.S. Rubber in Buffalo, <clears throat> and who was told to go inside a tank to spray this, the tank with some form of chemical in order to house the chemicals that they were going to put in there without eroding the metal. He and 10 other peoples died the next day as a result of this inhalation because they weren't given safety features like gas masks. So my mother became a widow, a very beautiful native woman. She became a widow and was raising seven children. I was seven years old. One day, all of a sudden, to our complete horror, we were basically eating scraps because we weren't getting social assistance on any level. So here we are on a consistent diet of toast, butter, and sugar. And all of a sudden, one day, my mother walked out to go and get some groceries or to try to get something to eat, and all of a sudden, the police 
and the Child Welfare Department came in and kicked the door wide open and to our horror, we turned around and looked and they came and abducted us. And they threw us inside of a cars, different cars. They took us down to this agency and we were all separated and our mother never saw her children again until 18 years later. So this policy was done to hundreds of thousands of Indian peoples throughout the Western Hemisphere. And initially, like I say in my autobiography, we were put into these white foster homes and then it was thrown into a boarding school to become institutionalized by the whores of this particular policy of the United States government. And in being placed inside of this boarding school, which is a residential school, I went through years of being beaten and tortured and attempts to sexually abuse me while I was in prison, or while I was in this child's prison. And the priest and the nuns had each and every one of us in the dormitories that night. And around midnight, they would come in and they would snatch children and they would take them to different places and they would sodomize the children and force them into oral sex and rape the young baby girls and baby boys, mostly Indian children. And so, this was the beginning of a process of horror. It was terrorism, psychological terrorism on youth. And at that very tender, very young age, I realized that this was a horrible dilemma while they raped the children and beat us, they yelled out, you filthy fucking Indians. This is your lot. Be glad that we've come to Christianize you. It was horrible. It was a horrible situation. And so this was the indoctrination into this world. It was the indoctrination into democracy in America and the establishment of democratic processes in this, this side of the world from European encroachment. And as a child, I somehow automatically knew that this was definitely not moral or correct. And that there, if there was some God, this God certainly was not deeming this level of horror and abuse. So I initially, even out of fear as a child, began to fight. Because just before they took us completely, I had seen my mother one day at the child welfare department, and she was crying. And I was somewhat, before we even went into the boarding school, I'm sitting there with a toy machine gun and I'm just kind of blasting away, playing. And my mother says, kept trying to talk to me, but I was just too engaged as a child trying to play. And she slapped me across the face saying, Johnny, you're going to have to open your eyes because it's a terrible world out there and you're going to have to survive. Wake up, you can no longer be a child. And from that moment on, at the age of seven, my eyes were open. I played less and less, and I watched more and more, and I had to begin to learn to survive. Now I'll go through a whole series of situations, and I'll take you so many years down the road out of desperation after being in all these residential schools, surviving attempts at rape, surviving the tortures and the beatings, and being placed under continual institutions, that the more I rebelled, the more they beat me and tried to beat me into submission. 
But the more I continued to fight, and by the time I had gotten to be about 18 years old and had worked on these farms for slave wages in these state schools for boys, by this time I was becoming a very strong, powerful young man, but a very angry person. And I was let loose into Buffalo, New York to run the straights for the first year of my life since the time I was seven. When I got into Buffalo, <clears throat> I joined gangs, but because of all of the abuse of my life, I started to drink, I started to drug, and I had absolutely no way. I went into a total dysfunctional situation. I had absolutely no roots, no way to, of surviving in the street. I was given $40 and some funny looking checkerboard suit. And yet I began to sleep in the parks. As it started getting cold, I decided to drink some Southern Comfort to stay warm. But it was right around the same time that there was this great movement that seemed to be going on and I started watching all these different people that were mobilizing against the war in Vietnam. I didn't know what that was about, but I began to meet people that were, that were you know, activists and they were raising great resistance in the cities and massive demonstrations and I was wondering what this was all about meeting people during that time. But it would be a while before I would begin to formulate a political awareness and a consciousness because what happened next is while I was in the street one day out of a, a pure desperation I decided to stick up a store. I never robbed a store before. I didn't even have a weapon so I decided to take my my coat and walk into a store. I saw a woman there, and being the sexist that I was as a kid, I walked in thinking that she'd be an easy prey. I put my finger in there and I stuck it in there. I said, okay, this is a stick up. And she laughed at me. And she knew I was shaking, I was scared. But I needed some money, I wanted to get out of the street. Next thing I know, she calls her brothers, a couple Italian guys, Luigi, Luigi, come and get this guy. They come running down the stairs. They were mafia related. It was a little mom and pop store, but they were dealing drugs out of there and everything else. And they were allowed to operate by the police, but yet they were going to snatch me and hold me till the police got there. And at the age of 18, here I am sitting in the store. They've apprehended me, and I'm trying to work my way out of there. And they said, No, we're not going to let you go. And they want to know, Why'd you do it? I said, Well, I'm, I'm sleeping in the street, I'm homeless. I'm cold, it's 30 below zero out here in Buffalo, New York. I'm sleeping in hallways trying to make myself warm with newspapers. So they said, here, eat the submarine sandwich. So that was my big heist. <laughs> and I suppose I feel sort of ashamed in the presence of a great bank robber like Ed Mead here. <laughs> And you know for damn sure, you don't walk into the penitentiary and tell somebody that's what you did. You robbed a submarine. Oh yeah? Who drove it? No, 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 a submarine sandwich. An Italian one at that, that gave me heartburn on my way to jail. So here I am, 18 years old, on my way to jail. I go into the penitentiary. I get into the detention center. Before you know it, I'm before a court. They're sitting there trying to wear me down day in, day out, every single day. They're wearing me down, and it's systemically uh, done this way to put you in a holding center, a detention center, and then you're just bored all day long with nothing to do, day in and day out, and eventually they got this thing called the plea bargain system where they want you to make a plea to cop to, a, to, to the charge so that you don't have to go through trials. And this way, 90% of the people that go before the courts end up making a plea so that they can get on and get the sentence over with and get over and get out. So in this case, uh, I, made, I was talking with this court appointed attorney that was come to me that was given to me, and as we were talking, uh, he says, well, look, he says, you know, well, you know, it's, it's obvious that you're guilty. <clears throat> And, uh, but you know, this is your first offense, so I'm sure we can get uh, probation for you. So, uh, so if you agree to uh, you know, say that you were guilty, I'll get you before the judge and we'll, and we'll get you probation, and probably time served in probation. So I said, okay, good. That sounds good to me. So I went over and I pled guilty, 
And the judge looked at me and says, oh yeah, I'm not surprised. He said, well, let me tell you something, Mr. Hill. He says, uh, he said, savages like you need to be locked up in a cage. I'm giving you eight years. Get him out of here. Eight years for an attempted robbery. Eight years for a submarine sandwich. And this is where my prison sojourn began. Uh, I went into a number of different penitentiaries. Uh, I went through the for reforms, uh, reformatory called Elmira Reformatory in upstate New York. And this, of course, is the orientation process that they put you through in order to classify you as to where you're best suited, what prison is best suited for you. And of course, they always tell you that you can either go through educational programs and or else you can go through this industrial process. You can become a worker. But of course, you know, once you're locked up and uh, you hear that clanging of that bar behind you, those gates, you know, this is it. You're walking into a jungle and all of a sudden you're looking at men that are just huge and that have been working out for years and are some very terrifying looking people. And all of a sudden you know, you realize as a young man, you're looking relatively soft and really too good for that environment. And all of a sudden you become very afraid. Trepidation sets in. It now becomes a struggle for survival, and all of a sudden, somebody starts to come to try to give you assistance, to pull you into their circle, to give you protection, and then you've got to constantly wait to see who wants to screw you. But you're also told by the so-called good guys, you're going to have to learn to establish yourself in this brutal world which means you're gonna to have to get a knife, you're gonna to have to make a shank, make a pipe, do something, look at the biggest, baddest dude to go over there and wear his ass and kill him if you have to. Because otherwise, somebody's gonna be trying to screw you day in and day out. And so that's the way. That is the law in prison. So, while I was in prison, uh, I began to pick out who I thought needed a good ass kicking. And I picked out the guys that were out there forcibly raping other young brothers coming into jail. And I got my pipe and I walked up to them and smashed them right across the forehead split their, split the head right open, knocked them out, poured them out, went to solitary confinement, and established myself as a person that would not allow anybody to abuse me. But I did, in fact, attack the abusers because I had actually already been trained to fight myself against the same kind of abuse in these boarding schools, these residential schools. And the story is very, very, very long. Many years in the penitentiary. Well, I was in Elmira Reformatory, and then I went to another prison in New York called Coxsackie State Prison. And when I went up there, I found out that I was going to be assigned to the kitchen, to the mess hall. And I found out that there was a number of different industries that were offered to me. One of the industries, the shops that the, uh, they offered to me was to go work in the metal shop. And uh, in that process, uh, I found out and was horrified at the realization that the prison administration were using these shops as sweat shops for slave labor with slave wages. They were paying two cents a day to work in sweatshops all day long, manufacturing goods, which I later found out was going to the outside world for millions of dollars of profits in the long run. And years down the road to this day, I find out that this same 
sweatshop slave wage system is being conducted in conjunction with the major transnational corporations in America through corporations, privatized corporations like Wacken Hut, who have made a whole industry out of inmate slave labor, who today are still capitalizing by the billions of dollars because people like Bill Clinton have sent people that use drugs, marijuana possessors, to jail by the millions in order to allow privatized industrial corporations like Wackenhut to industrialize and to set up privatized prisons all across the country, to stack the prisons, to be able to make contracts with people that suppliers for food, for bedding, for whatever a prison needs. There is usually the rural white areas that get, that build the prisons. The community goes to work. You end up with white guards and everybody in the area does business with the prison. And this is what we have today. And this is one of the reasons why you've got Fortune 500 saying that the biggest growth industry in the United States is the prison industry. So this is why you can turn around and look at any law today and you'll find out that every time somebody, you'll see your friends today and they'll be gone tomorrow and they'll be in some prison and it's because there's new prisons being made and they gotta stack them so that they can justify monies from the federal government and they can, get, and they can justify budgets to get the monies to keep the industry going. But of course, I didn't know all that when I first went in. I had absolutely no clue that that's what was going down because I was young. But like my mother said, keep your eyes open. Don't go to sleep. And so I watched. And while I was in there, I became very opposed to these sweatshops and tried to create general work strikes. One time I set up a strike with a bunch of the brothers and said, look, we got to stop this work stop. It should demand more money and better wages. We have to demand better conditions in prisons. We need better food, better qualitative food. We need conditions to be upgraded in these horrible situations. So we had a prison strike and we sat out there and refused to go to work all day long. The next thing you know, the prison guards came in. They brought in German shepherds with gas and mace and they unleashed the dogs on us and the dogs started ripping us apart while we were bleeding. And then they came in with their, with their batons and started beating us half to death. They put us into solitary confinement and sent us off the next day to Attica. In 1971, I was sent to Attica State Prison 16 days before the rebellion occurred. During the time that we were in prison, we started getting material from people who were actively involved outside in social resistance movement. Ed Mead was talking about the Prairie Fire Manual. I had a copy of that Prairie Fire Manual. I read that Prairie Fire Manual and was totally inspired by what was in that manual. I was totally inspired by that manual because one of the weathermen was right there in a cell next to me by the name of Sam Melville. He was known as the Mad Bomber. He was right next to me and became one of my political mentors. He started talking to me every day. He started educating me about what was going on in this capitalist society and the necessity to begin to undermine the state and the tactics that they used to weather underground, Marilyn Buck and the rest of the resistance six, and what they had begun to do to undermine 
the capitalist structure and began to, under, began to define economics to me and began to let me see that I was actually a victim and not a criminal. I was a victim of a criminal system. And he began to open my eyes some more. Another set of books was given me to a bro by another brother. And they were written by George Jackson, a prisoner, a black political prisoner in San Quentin. And in the book, I read Blood in My Eyes. And then I read letters from George Jackson. And that book was going all over the prison population. By this time, there was a great antisocial movement happening. There was the rise of the Black Panther Party. There was the Black Liberation Army, the Puerto Rican Liberation Army, the women's group, the women's movement was getting very powerful. There was the anti-war movement. Before you know it, all of these people were coming in as political prisoners, prisoners of conscience, and they were starting to educate us who didn't know, who didn't understand, and we began to create cells to teach one another what was going on in this world to reconnect ourselves to who we are as human beings. And so after reading George Jackson's books, I was totally inflamed by what he wrote because he spoke to my anger. He spoke to my need to grab that capitalist system like a bull and grab it by the horns and turn it and twist it until you snap its neck. And he was such a powerful motivator in my life. And then one day, we heard that George Jackson had went on a visit. And that the guards in the prison said that George Jackson had a afro. And inside of his afro was a 38 snub nose. And he was plotting to escape with that 38. And so they shot and killed him 19 times. They shot him and murdered George Jackson. At that time, you could not congregate more than three people without getting basically bludgeoned to death for defining an order inside a prison. We decided to just say to hell with that because many of us were given the label of being militants because we were constantly engaging, fighting, and going to solitary confinement and being tortured when we went to solitary confinement. So when this happened to George Jackson, everybody unanimously came out to the yard and we all did a prayer. We put black armbands around our white shirts and we had 10 minutes of silence in prayer unanimously for the spirit and the respect of George Jackson. The guards become unnerved. Two days later, a black man, a white man, we're in the yard scrimmaging for a football game. As they're scrimmaging, a lieutenant comes out with 15 guards and he yells out, lock that fucking nigger up now. And the white guy that was with him said, well, if you lock him up, you're gonna lock me up too. And so the guard, uh, the lieutenant says, well, lock that nigger lover up too. And all of a sudden, when they went to grab this brother by the name of Leroy Dewar, Leroy Dewar punched the lieutenant in the mouth, which was completely unheard of. Because you knew that the second that you hit a guard like that, you were dead. And as soon as he did that, had we not jumped to his defense that very moment, he would have been dead. And so would have that brother, white brother, that would have went to the box with him. So I'm sitting there and I happen to be lifting some weights and seemed to be getting very, very strong, physically fit, and was also, you know, was also uh, uh, learning to box and fight by one of the sparring uh, partners from Muhammad Ali back then who was in jail but I was going to be a pro fighter, I was going to be a middleweight contender, 
And so I was fighting golden gloves in the joint, but I was sitting there lifting some weights and pushed the weight up. And just as I was pushing about 240 pounds up on a bench press, all of a sudden this big guy, big Indian guy that was behind me, grabbed me and said, holy shit, did you see that? I said, what? He said, man, that brother man over there just punched that guard in the mouth, that lieutenant in the mouth. I said, whoa. I jumped up, and all of a sudden, just it was almost clockwork. Everybody just ran and got this brother's defense. So there was like this unseen solidarity that had never been seen before. Everybody surrounded the brother. And the lieutenant was there by the name of Maroney, and he said, and you could see he's now visibly shaking, and so are all the guards that are with him. And so the, the lieutenant Maroney says, hey, uh, uh, I give you my, my Eagle Scout honor. We won't lock him up. I jumped through the crowd, slapped him in the head and face and said, fuck you and your Eagle Scout honor, bunk. I was 19 years old and this Italian brother was behind me. He grabbed me and he said, young blood, he called me, eh? He said, man, them motherfuckers will kill you. I said, fuck it, let's go. Let's go. But I slipped through the crowd and everybody was there and they were just like totally shook. Everybody gets back to the cell and now they're looking for the people that had been in the fight. They wanted Leroy Dewar and they wanted the white guy named Ray Lamori and they were looking for a young guy they had never seen before who looked like a Puerto Rican young lord with pop marks on his face. That's the way the Attica Commission read years down the road. So I'm sitting over there brushing my teeth watching them come, but by this time I had taken two razor blades and a can opener and a piece of wire and just two blades on each side. So if somebody comes and I make my move, you get sliced, you got two gashes to have to deal with, and I'm going to make my final stand because I know they're going to kill me, but somebody's going with me. That was my feeling. Let's get it on. But I'm sitting there, but if I didn't have to, that was cool too. I'm sitting there brushing my teeth. <laughs> sitting there brushing my teeth, and this guy comes down, this big, ugly looking guard, a uh, lieutenant. He's standing, he looks in there, and he says, and the guards are looking like this, and they're like, he's looking, and then he goes, mm, no. Right? So he walks on, I said, right? <laughs> finish brushing my teeth. That night, they came and got those two brothers from another cell block. And all of a sudden, we could hear all of this yelling and screaming going on. And I looked out at night over to the other cell blocks, and I could see the lit up cell block. And I looked, and I could see all these fires and all this noise and cans and stuff being raised. And apparently, they tried to take the brothers out of the cell, and everybody that was in the cell was throwing cans and burning toilet paper and, and paper and everything. And everybody was like saying, we're going to get you in the morning. So the word went, and you know as fast how fast things could travel in the penitentiary. Something happened here today. Tomorrow morning, the whole penitentiary knows. That's the prison grapevine. Next morning, they locked them two brothers up. We figured, hey, they're going to kill them. The word was, you get to the mess hall, and there's a general food fast. Nobody takes food. We got into the mess hall, the, the 1,300 prisoners, the only people that ate that day, that morning, were the diabetics that had to eat. You could see 300 guards around in that mess hall, and you could hear their keys shaking without a sound. You could just hear their rattling. They knew we, like caged animals, had smelt the blood. We smelled their fear. We knew they were afraid their illusions of power and invincibility had just been shattered right before our eyes. And so at that point, we knew we were going to take this place. Something was going down. We were walking down the hallway, walking back towards our cell. There was a captain. Usually the doors are unlocked, the gates to go out to the prison yard, to get ready for your assignment for the day, to go somewhere. We went outside. We get outside. Uh, we are re ready to go to go outside to wait for the assignment, but the door was locked. So they were trying to get everybody back into their cells. They were gonna lock the prison down. That's what they were gonna do and probably shake down for weapons and whatever else. 
so-called contraband that they could get in there taking and going through people's properties. There was a brother by the name from the Black Panther Party walked up <clears throat> to the captain as he was coming down in, in cell block number nine, which I was in, and cell block number five, which was the militant, you know, that's where everybody that had the big M, the militant label was housed in cell block five. But our two tiers converged and we were walking down the same hallway and this brother from the Panther Party said, hey, what happened to those two brothers last night? The captain says, well, I, I tell you, I don't know, fellas, but I'll get back to you. The Panther brother said, you're full of shit. Boom! Hits him in the jaw. As he's going down, Sam Melville kicks him right in the ribs, cracks his rib, and that's when I turned around and said, take this fucking place now. This is it, the riot. Take Attica now. The jump. That was the spark. We turned around before you know it. It was like that spark to set off that prairie fire Ed was talking about. It was just like a match in a dry field. Before you know it, people who were doing life bids on top of life bids who had never seen the stars for 20 years, 30 years, Everybody was in a rage, and everybody automatically started seizing hostages. And before you, it was unbelievable how many people could move it all at one time so fast, so hard. And in a moment's notice, we were organizing in chaos, mass confusion, but there were people that were coming to the forward, no, get the hostages, take them out to the yard. Seize the materials in the commissary. Get this closing. Take the hostages' clothes off. Put them in the inmates' clothing so that the enemy doesn't know who they are. And before you know it, they had four gateways, four quarters, four blocks. And at where all gates came together, there was an area that was controlled by the guards on the inside, and they had the keys. You couldn't get from one block cell, cell block to the other unless you got through that gate those four gates. They had the gates locked up. By this time, you could hear the siren in the city, the town of Attica. You could hear this loud siren. They knew this was it. The prison was being seized. They lost control. All of a sudden, that area, what we, what we call that four corners, we actually call Times Square. But right there at that area, they had the gate big iron, cast iron gates that went from maybe here to Ed. And they were all locked. The guards wouldn't give up the keys. So 60 of us from A block kept shaking this one cast iron gate. Just hoping that it would snap or something, a weld. We ripped the gate out of the wall. The official Attica Commission said it was a defective weld. I'm here to tell you we ripped it right out the wall. The wall came down in that corner. <laughs> Sixty determined people, black, white, yellow, and brown, brought it down. Brought it down. We opened that gate. When that gate went down, it hit one of the guards in the head. And it killed the guy two days later. But they blamed that guard's death on me because I'm the one said, take this fucking place now. So I was charged with this guard's murder. We held the prison for five days and we set up an elaborate negotiating table. We told the state that we demanded that they send in the mass media for the first time in the history of the New York State or the country's penal system. We were able to force the state, and there was a guy by the name of Russell Oz, uh, G. Oswald, who was, the, was the, uh, the head of the New York State prison system and directly answerable only to Nelson Rockefeller, who was the governor of New York at that time, 
For the first time in the history, he conceded to sending CBS in, NBC, ABC, and they came in as well as a number of different evolving cable TV networks came in. And when they came inside the prison, we knew we had won. And the reason we knew we had won, because they could not discredit and smear us and say this, that, and the other without, uh, from a one-sided perspective, but the whole world could see from themselves what we were doing. And here we were, 1,200, almost 1,300 men beginning to set up an elaborate negotiation with state senators and with, with uh, uh, William Kunstler, uh, a civil rights attorney who was coming to represent us. State, state Assemblyman Arthur O. Eve and a number of different people, Tom Wicker from the New York Times. Before you know it, we began to negotiate our grievances in the prison system, starting with the sweatshops and the exploitation of the labor of the prisoners the fact that inmates were not allowed to write home uh, 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 to, 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 to be able to communicate. Spanish prisoners couldn't communicate in Spanish. There was a whole 28, a list of 31 demands, and many of the demands were becoming to seem as if we were engaging in negotiations for reform. Some of us said to hell with reform. We're not trying to make prison conditions better so we can enjoy our oppression. Some of us said to hell with that. First of all, we want amnesty from criminal investigation while we are waiting for helicopters to come and pick up those of us who want transportation to a non-imperialistic country where 17 countries in the world said they would take us. Well, as soon as we threw in that demand, that was it. <laughs> Rockefeller said, sorry, boys, no helicopters. <laughs> sorry, boys, you're going to stay in a capitalist country. Sorry, boys, you're going to die in a capitalist country. That was Rockefeller's response. After negotiating with the state for five days, New York State, assembled and amassed over 1,000 state troopers, as well as guards who worked in the prison but were not on duty when the time when we seized the penitentiary. On September the 13th, 1971, these same state troopers were being sent up to a place, they were halfway to a place called Onondaga Indian Territory. And most people don't know this historically. Because what happened in Onondaga Indian Territory was is that the chiefs of the longhouse of that territory told New York State that they would not allow them to expand a highway, highway running through sovereign Indian Territory in New York. They wanted to expand it to a four-lane highway. The chiefs in Onondaga Territory said no, and it created a major conflict with the state, and they threatened to come in with bulldozers and the state troopers, and then they called on my people, the Onondagas called on the Mohawk, who came down 800 strong with every kind of conceivable fully automatic weapon ready to engage New York State on the question of indigenous sovereignty and self-determination. Halfway up, Halfway up to Onondaga, Rockefeller decided, well, it might be better to turn them around and send them into Attica on 1,200 unarmed men than to face the raft of 800 Mohawks at Onondaga, fully, fully loaded and ready for armed resistance. The street troopers were turned around as we were standing there trying to negotiate our transportation to a non-imperialist country. All of a sudden, the power in the prison was turned off that morning. You could hear this helicopter going whop, 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 whop. Rose up over the prison. Now, for some strange moment, we actually believed 
Maybe Bobby Seals was going to come through with a promise from the Black Panther Party to give us an arms drop. But that wasn't the case. It wasn't the case. And Bobby, you know I'm telling the truth. We never got the arms, but here's what we did get. The helicopter flew around and it said, put your hands on top of your head, surrender to an officer and you will not be harmed. Release the hostages. All of a sudden, there was a canister of gas, a big can dropped on the catwalk is where the guards are to overlook everybody in the prison yard which we had seized and were up on. And when the canister dropped on the catwalk, it exploded throughout the yard. Then there was four more canisters dropped on the yard. Then all of a sudden we could visibly see 1,000 state troopers up on top of the roof of the prison. We could see them amassing at the other corners of the prison wings. And then we heard the shots. Bam, 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 bam. All of a sudden, 25,000 rounds of bullets were shot into that yard. I just turned around in horror and watched a guy's face blow up in a red mist right in front of me. And it looked like he went down in, so, in slow motion. I could hear somebody screaming, oh my God, please help me, help me, help me. And I heard people screaming. All of a sudden I saw one brother from the black Liberation Army holding a flag, the Black Liberation flag, and he was getting so many bullets, hundreds of bullets, and he just stood there till they stopped shooting him, and he went down. And I heard them say, you fucking niggers, Sam Melville, where are you? And Sam come running out from somewhere, and they took shotgun and blow Sam's chest wide open. I come out of one of the cell blocks, and I come out with my sword, and I started charging the state trooper. And all of a sudden, when I swung, I got hit, hit with something. And the sword fell when I ran into, uh, out of this cloud of gas, which was choking everybody. Banded by the Geneva Convention in 1906 as cruel and unusual chemicals to be used in warfare. This guard, the state trooper, put a shotgun right into my face, pulled the trigger, and the clip fell out. And it jammed. I was shocked. He was shocked. Two other pigs were shot. Shocked. They looked at me, and it hit me across the face with the butt of the gun. And they picked me up and they threw me over the catwalk 32 feet to the ground. I hit the handball court and almost broke my back. And I laid right on top of somebody who had all of their chest blown out and their neck was just gushed out. And I was watching people trying to get up and trying to fight. And I saw one brother by the name of Tommy Hicks grab a baseball bat and smash the cop over the head. And the cop went down. When he grabbed the gun, some other inmate came in and said, no, 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 don't. Put the gun down. Peace, brother. And all of a sudden, the other cops came and just wasted Tom. That day, I saw state troopers take guns and shove it up inmates' asses and pull the trigger. Shove it down the mouth and blow 
the trigger. 43 people were killed that day in a massacre. 80 people were wounded and maimed it for life. 61 of us were indicted for being leaders at Attica. Ah. The whole world heard about that massacre. Every prisoner across the country knew about that massacre. And there was a rally cry around the world, Attica, Attica. Attica means fight back because Attica is all of us, became the slogans. And there were many people from many different political organizations, from revolutionary organizations, both domestically and abroad, that honored the rebellion at Attica because we dared to win. We dared to struggle and we dared to win. We took our captors to task because it was time to take them to task because they had murdered thousands of peoples and buried them in unmarked graves long before the massacre at Attica. And if I'm lying, Ed, you tell him I'm lying. And they're doing it to our brothers and sisters today as we are talking. Because Attica only changed things for a little while. Sixty-one of us were indicted. Ramsey Clark, Bill Kunstler, Danny Myers, Elizabeth Fink, Bob Bloom, Michael Tiger, Many, many powerful people came to our defense, and that's where I was here. I finally got out on bail in 1973. I was facing the electric chair at the ripe age of 19 years old. But fortunately, in 1973, while I was in jail with the number one indictment for allegedly killing this cop, The Supreme Court ruled the death penalty unconstitutional then. So it made me more eligible to go before a judge and to receive bail. I was given a $10,000 bail. And some white people that I didn't even know, an older couple, put up their $100,000 home as collateral to get me out because they believed in what we did at Attica. And I promised them that I would never abscound because of their kindness and generosity. I gave them my word, even if I had to go back in prison and face the unofficial death sentence of prison guards looking for revenge from someone stigmatized with the with the label of being a cop killer. I was a dead man, a young man at that. But while I was on bail, waiting for the jury to come in, I happened to get involved with 400 Mohawk warriors And we decided to go into upstate New York at a place called Ginyonge. And we decided that there was 20,000 acres of Mohawk land that was illegally usurped by the Rockefeller family. So 400 of us with every form of conceivable weapon you can think of went up there and retook stolen Indian land. Now, mind you, I'm on bail. And I've got a condition. I'm not supposed to be in the possession of arms. Oh, and by the way, I'm not allowed to vote. Which doesn't mean anything after this stolen election in 1990, uh, in, in this last election with George Bush. 
94,000 black voters, man, thrown off the list because they were supposed to be ex-cons. In fact, those 94,000 black voters turned out to be four ex-cons, and they never allowed those 94,000 ballots, 94,000 votes to be put back into the count, which would have put Al Gore into the White House, and the U.S. Supreme Court put the big stamp of approval on it, the stolen election. So, so much for Malcolm X is the conflict between the ballot and the bullet, because there is no ballot. So what do you got left? It's getting serious out here. It's getting very serious. So here we are, up at a place called Ginyage. We've liberated this territory and held it for months while going back and forth to trial. They don't know I'm up there, but I'm involved in a standoff at Gustafson Lake. One day, a car full of rednecks come driving up the back roads way up in a place called Moss Lake, Eagle Bay. As they're driving up, they take guns and they start shooting into the camp and they grazed one of the young boys picking medicines. He falls to the ground, screaming. The Mohawk warriors assembled on the return trip down. They launched a bunch of bullets into the car and it just so happens a bullet went in and hit one, a young girl, but nine years old. Why would you go shooting into an armed Mohawk camp with a nine-year-old girl in your car? Well, she got hit in the back and this got the New York State Troopers all riled up. Governor Hugh Carey had succeeded Rockefeller and his lieutenant governor was Mel uh, Mario Cuomo. So they sent up another thousand state troopers to, can, to engage us up at Gustafus, I mean, up at uh, Ginyonge. Here they are. We could see them coming up, up this big winding mountain at dusk, and all these lights on look like a big winding snake. As they came up, we decided that we would hold an ambush for them when they got up. What we did was put on some white sheets. You know, the kind the Klan liked to wear. But not necessarily with the point. These were progressive white sheets. <laughs> so we threw on the white sheets and we put some holes in it because there's six feet of snow all up in that mountainous area. So we're sitting in the snow with these white sheets and all of our weapons with pine branches on them. So we just look like mountains of snow and little trees. <laughs> when they got into every checkpoint we had set up, we threw off the robes and went there with the guns right to their faces. And every one of those state troopers began to beg for their lives and shit on themselves. And and we're screaming not to kill me. Please don't kill me. I got a wife, family, and kids that are waiting for me to come home. Well, there was lots of wives, families, and kids waiting for those men to come home from Attica. And you know what? It was the same D squad that went in and killed everybody in Attica. And yet our war chiefs said, Don't kill him. The head of the state police force was part Mohawk, a guy by the name of Shea. He called in to Kerry, Governor Kerry, and Governor Kerry said, turn them around because I don't want Ganyonge to be my Attica. Turned a thousand away. Mario Como came back up to negotiate with the Mohawks and settled with our people for 50,000 acres of land further up in a much more fertile agricultural land base near the border of Montreal in a place outside of another prison industrial complex in a, a concentration camp known as Dannemora, Clinton, and set the nation to today there is the permanent settlement liberated nation of Mohawk territory at Kenyonge, and today there is a whole 
flourishing nature, nation of Mohawks and children living in self-determination and sovereignty according to our own natural great law. I went back into prison and as I'm in there waiting for my death sentence to be carried out, I'm just prepared as much as possible to stay alive. All of a sudden, after seven attempts to murder me while I was in prison, and I beat every one of them, I can tell you right now, I beat every one of them to the ground. I broke some bones and I knocked some people into semi-consciousness. I can tell you right now, I stayed alive. Because I was strong and I'm a fighter. But seven attempts to murder me by neo-Nazis and prison guards. To this point, I was the only one convicted for anything out of Attica. Then all of a sudden, there was a whistleblower by the name of Malcolm Bell, who was working on the Attorney General staff, investigating murders that were committed by the New York State troopers to a second grand jury. All of those vicious atrocities that I was telling you about were being investigated by a second grand jury and at that same time, Nelson Rockefeller was facing confirmation as the vice president of the United States under Gerald Ford. Nelson Rockefeller commissioned a person by the name of Anthony B. Simonetti, who was the head of the Bureau of Criminal Investigation trying to get them to suppress any evidence going before that second grand jury of these outright murders committed by the state troopers because the Democrats, who still had guts back then, who don't have any guts today, were nailing them up against the wall on the blood he shed at Attica. He ordered at Attica. This Malcolm Bell supplied a 60-page report to the New York Times and the New York Times said that they would sit on that report until after my conviction. They sat on that report for three months, which would have caused for a massive commission. But they waited in complicity with the New York State government to release that report until after I was convicted and after the cost of a $50 million investigation. After I went back in and seven attempts to kill me, finally this blew up in the New York Times. Hugh Carey commissioned a guy by the name, a former judge by the name of uh, somebody Scott, I forget his first, Bernard Scott. The Bernard, Bernard Scott Commission. And to investigate these allegations. And in the long run, Bernard Scott found after three years that the allegations were true. and recommended to Hugh Carey that he close the books on Attica, and this is what they did. First, they granted a blanket amnesty to all state troopers and guards that went back into prison from any criminal prosecution rising out of charges from Attica. Huh? Second, the pending 60 indictments against the rest of the Attica brothers would be dismissed. And in my case, I was granted a so-called executive clemency, which was not a pardon, there's a differentiation. And the executive clemency made me eligible to go to a parole board, and based on the recommendations of a governor's recommendation for my release, the parole commission, the parole panel should have released me. Well, that wasn't the case because in the first time in the history of New York, based on the recommendations of Governor Hugh Carey, I was denied parole and given two more years because a state senator by the name of Dale Volker and another one by the name of Volker petitioned the acting chairman of the New York State Parole Board, who was facing confirmation hearings for $70,000 a year job, a guy by the name of Edward Hammack, and threatened his confirmation if I was released. I got two more years to do with two more attempts to kill me, which is all critiqued in my autobiography. And then when I went back to the parole board, by this time I was the lone scapegoat of Attica. And by this time, the whole world was calling for my release. 
Uh, there was a time that Jimmy Carter said to the rest of the world that we do not have any political prisoners in the United States. And his own ambassador, Andrew Young, his ambassador to the United Nations said that is a crock of shit. He said there's at least 100 political prisoners. And on his list of political prisoners, I was the number one political prisoner on his list, including Leonard Peltier, who by this time had been abducted from Canada, Hinton, Alberta, who is now the longest held political prisoner in North America, 27 years. When I went before the parole board the second time, by this time, every major newspaper in the world was calling me the lone scapegoat and demanding my release. On March of 1979, I was finally released after a total of 27 years of confinement in prison. And this is just scratching the surface. Attica was the turning point in America for a spotlight on prisons and what was, what was taking place in prisons because of the number of people that was killed, because of the way in which it was done, and because of the voices that came out of Attica, which were voices that previously had not been heard. When I first entered prison in the 40s, Attica was famed for being impregnable. No way could you do anything with Attica because it was four different yards and they were separated. And these guys did do something. As a member of the New York State Legislature, I was involved in prison reform for the last two or three years. So when I heard, I immediately went to Attica and asked to be allowed to go in. And what kind of structure was there among the inmates? Tightest organization I've ever seen in my life. They had a central committee that sat at a long table and then they rotated the chairmanship. We got a list of about 30 some or 31 demands, and we took those back out to the commissioner for him to respond. The demands were decent food, the right to practice their religion, whatever it was, education. You know, all these things were, were, were the demands. People just wanted to be treated like human beings. Nobody was asking that, you know, you exonerate us from what we did. We know we made a mistake, but give us an opportunity to do something about the mistakes that we made because we're all going back in the community. Give us something to go back in and give us some tools. Now, the inmates were sleeping on the ground. I saw this. I saw it. And they were sleeping on the ground. Some of them had blankets, some of them did not. But all of the hostages were sleeping on mattresses, and they all had blankets. The prisoners sometimes only got one square a day. The hostages got three squares a day. I'm talking about square meals. When Attica occurred, I was on Rackus Island, and everybody in the cell block was just fixed to the TV. Every time a special report would come into my attic. We were fixed to the TV, following the developments. There's square control. This is D yard, where nearly all the prisoners still loose are congregated. We're looking now at a group on top of square control. And then we devised a letter, a message to the governor. And it went something like this. Governor, please come to Attica to talk to the Observer Committee. Please come because we feel that a massacre might take place, that the lives of the hostages and the inmates might be lost. And then suddenly the 13th occurred, and I mean, I was just spellbound. I, 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 it was total disbelief that the government would use so much force. On the 13th, the morning of the 13th, everybody in the yard knew something was going to happen. I mean, it was just that feeling. It was that feeling that something is going to bend today. Something is going to break. 7.05 a.m. September 13th. We're on the roof of A block waiting for the assault to begin. This is a team of 270 rifle shooters. 
At the time that, that the prison was retaken, was I was in C block, and I was looking out the window, and on the roof surrounding the yard were National Guard troops and prison guards. They had their rifles and shotguns, some of them had pistols, and um, they were looking down into the yard, and then the helicopter came across and dropped the tear gas into the yard. The big helicopter came over. You heard on the loudspeaker, lay down, put your hands on your head, and you're not be home. And right after the tear gas fell, all of these guys that were lined up on the roof were pointed down into the yard and just commenced the firing. And as I'm looking around and I'm laying down, I'm seeing the ground is like literally moving around me. The ground was moving from bullets. The next thing I remember was waking up in the hospital, bandaged from head, my foot, my leg. It was the most stunning event that ever happened in my life, to just witness, for me, cold-blooded murder. I think what Attica did, it gave Mr. and Mrs. America an opportunity to look inside these places and see that, wait a minute, Everything is not all right here. As a result of Attica, a, a spotlight was turned on the prison system in the United States. A spotlight that began to ask some very hard questions about why people were in prison and what happened to them while they were in prison. And I think that it took those 43 lives uh, to bring about this kind of change in the prison system. We're talking about a radical, fundamental change that went to the core of what prisons were supposed to be about and began to reconstruct prison activities from the ground up. As a result of Attica, for instance, um, college programs came into the prisons. Prior to Attica, prisoners had nothing to do in prison. There were no programs. They locked in at 4 o'clock. There were no law libraries. There was nothing that a guy can do. And after Attica, there were all kinds of possibilities. Now, you, you might say, well, they lost their lives. Yes, but they are heroes because they wrote a page that we're never going to forget and nobody else is going to forget. We were made to strip, lay in the mud, face down, and crawl to a guard 10 to 20 feet away from the guard that had you stripped. Uh, at that point, that guard would mark an X with white chalk on the back of select inmates who were then removed from the mud physically by two additional guards placed in a line to run a gauntlet of correction officers to be beaten all the way to another cell block. You know, you gotta let me explain it this way, you know? It was very, very barbaric, you know, very, very cruel, you know, and I, you know, and I really feel it, you know, what they really did, you know, they ripped our clothes off, and they made us crawl on the ground like we were animals, you know, and they snatched me and they, they laid me on the table, you know, and they beat me in my testicles, and they buried me with cigarettes, and they dropped hot shells on me. And they put a football up under my throat and they kept telling me that if it dropped, they was going to kill me. And I really felt, you know, after seeing so many people shot, for no apparent reason, that they really were going to do this. Armed rebellion of the type we have faced threatens the destruction of our free society. We cannot permit that destruction to happen. It has indeed been an agonizing decision. We had predicted the day before that it was going to be a massacre. Uh, Herman Badillo turned to me and said, I don't know what the hurry was. He said, there's always time to die. And I don't know what the hurry was either. You know, those guys weren't going anywhere. They were inside 30-foot walls. 
It was uh, it was uh, September. It was getting cold up there. The food was running out. The sanitary conditions were bad. The place smelled awful. I mean, that sense of freedom that the guys had had to begin with, but, but just before being out of their cells, that was beginning to wear away in the reality of their situation. I don't know what the hurry was. They could have waited two days, three days, four days. Those guys would have given up. They didn't have to go in and kill them all. But they did. 39 men were killed in the assault, 29 inmates and 10 hostages. Among the dead, inmate leader Elliot Barkley. 89 men were seriously wounded. Hostage Michael Smith was shot four times in the abdomen. Three inmates were found stabbed to death, killed earlier by other prisoners. Initial reports by state officials that the hostages had died of sliced throats were refuted by the medical examiner. The first eight autopsies were on the cases identified to us as hostages. All eight cases died of gunshot wounds. The medical examiner's finding was significant. The inmates had no firearms. Gunfire by state troopers and prison guards was responsible for all the deaths during the retaking of the prison. What did you do during those moments when the assault was actually taking place, the order had been given? Well, I kept in touch by phone, and uh, I'll never forget the moment when uh, uh, the report uh, was given that 14 uh, guards had come out alive, and while I was on the phone with Bobby Douglas, uh, he said, now it's 15, now it's 16, now it's 17, he said, now 18. And we went up to 21. And I want to tell you, I was, I just was absolutely overwhelmed. I just didn't see how it was possible with 1,200 men in there armed with uh, electrified barricades, with trenches, with uh, uh, a pledge, uh, which they said that they would all uh, go right down uh, fighting to the, to the last man, how it was going to be possible. What does this tell you about the prisoners, Governor? Me. What does this tell you about the prisoners, the fact that so many men did emerge unharmed? You're talking now about, well, they, I think what it tells me is that uh, the use of uh, this gas is, is a fantastic uh, instrument in a situation. Governor, after not. that order had been given, did, did you pray? Not after it, I prayed before. In towns near Attica, people gathered to mourn the dead hostages. In the cities, families and friends carried the bodies of the dead inmates to their graves. and their dignity. Let's welcome Clinton Discussion. In the 1800s, William Sherman led an expedition of soldiers against the Cheyenne Indians and slaughtered 650 Cheyenne, mostly women and children, in cold blood with bayonets and guns. At the conclusion of the massacre, William Sherman sate, pranced around on his horse and said that the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Further down in history, when the phalanges bombed the housing structures of thousands of Palestinians in Sabra and Shatila. Ariel Sharon said that the only good Palestinian is a dead Palestinian. More 
years down the road, activists from all over the world who have condemned both the actions of the United States government and its colonial policies of genocide against indigenous peoples and the genocidal policies of the Israeli Zionist regimes against the Palestinian peoples and indigenous peoples worldwide have come together to say no to this naked aggression and no to this naked genocide and now both the Israeli government as well as the Bush administration and the neoconservatives that control the Bush administration have come to say that the only good activist in this world is a dead activist. And what a shameful, painful reality that has now hit our non-native brothers and sisters about the nature of struggle that's been going on for well over 512 years in the Western Hemisphere here and well over 100 years in the Mideast and particularly in, this, in the country of Palestine. To have one's daughter and or son taken from them solely because she was committed to witnessing and intervening with an organization, the International Solidarity Movement, to witness the naked aggression of the Israeli government, not the Israeli people, but the Israeli government, and the Israeli military, and not all of the Israeli military, although there are thousands of peacenecks who refuse to participate in this genocidal process but to stand in the way of a caterpillar to stop the Israeli government and the Israeli military from bulldozing the house of Palestinian people to killing Palestinian people in those houses. A policy which the United States government spends well over ten billion dollars a year to support from the U.S. taxpayer dollars supporting genocide in Palestine supporting a military base in Palestine, supporting first-rate capabilities in, in Israel with nuclear facilities and, and nuclear bombs and warheads. 280 nuclear warheads poised on 280 Arab cities throughout the Middle East. First-rate capability, that's what the U.S. pays U.S. taxpayers dollars for to support first-rate capability in the Middle East for world hegemonic interest of the multinational, transnational corporate interests worldwide, predominantly today for the world resources and predominantly the whole question of oil. Many of the other protesters that have gone as witnesses or have stepped in the way of harm's way have been shot through the face just like we've seen the rise of the anti-globalization movement nationally and internationally, the valiant resistance that's being taken to stop this corporate beast from its ever endless, greedy aggression for the resources of indigenous peoples worldwide. And we see people are being beat and brutalized and imprisoned. And now, post 9-11, we are watching the illegal detention and deportation of the Arab brothers and sisters to countries that practice torture. One thing we know today, we know more than any other time in our history together as peoples that we need each other more than ever. Because if the U.S. government or the Israeli government can kill these beautiful people's daughter, their child, their baby, with impunity and do not have to answer to the rule of law. They can kill any one of our children with impunity and continue to be the ruthless, genocidal, rubber burn nations that they are. They must be held accountable. Palestine must be free. We must stop this naked aggression. We must not give our tax dollars to continue to finance this genocide in Palestine. And we must stand up all together here tonight, put our hands together, 
and welcome these people, the chorus. Thank you very much.